and 85. Now here's your host, attorney Jeff Bastola. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in. I am Jeff Vastola, and I'm your host here every Saturday morning at 7.30 to give you free legal advice. We know it's early, but uh, if it's important, get up and tune into the show and call me with whatever may be going on in your world. You are free to ask me anything that you want. If I can answer your question right here and right now, then that's exactly what I will do. If I have to do the research to get back with you with a better answer, a more educated answer, then that's what also what I will do the following week. You just have to tune in the following week, or if you miss that show, those shows are always uploaded onto our website, our YouTube page, and you can also go to the radio show's website to find it there. So uh, you can find the answer all types of places. If you'd like to call into the show, it's 877-850-8585. A little bit of self-promotion here in the outset. Uh, this show is brought to you by my law firm, which is Vastola Legal. And if you want to talk to me anytime, whether it's on the weekend, at night, about a potential case, uh, call me on my cell phone, 833-VASTOLA, always goes to my cell phone. That's 833-827-8652. And I, I do that. I have a toll-free number that forwards to my cell phone so that I can be a resource in the event that you ever need an answer to a legal issue right away, uh, or if you feel like you need to speak with an attorney right away. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, all of these different things. Of course, our website, which is vastolalegal.com. And uh, we officially, officially opened up our new office down in the Keys. We have a domain name, injuredinthekeys.com. If you know of anybody that has any kind of an issue down in the Keys, uh, be sure to mention that we now have an office down there, please. And uh, remember, we have our first free legal seminar coming up on April 27th. It's going to be at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Palm Beach Gardens. It is free, as the name suggests. All you have to do is show up. Uh, we're going to have some raffle prizes. There's going to be a, uh, a set of tires that we're going to be giving away in addition to raffle prizes. And I'm going to have, uh, in addition to myself, some other presenters there to give all kinds of free information, not just necessarily legal uh, of course, we're going to cover the issue of insurance, which is near and dear to my heart, but I'm going to have actually a licensed insurance agent there to discuss those issues. Uh, health, going to have uh, some health topics covered. So April 27th from 1 to 4, and we're going to uh, have some drinks and some snacks and that kind of a thing, but it's at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Palm Beach Gardens. So put it on your calendar and make sure to attend. Uh, free legal seminar. Spread the word. This is the first one that we're doing. Uh, we have no idea what the attendance is going to be. It might be uh, one person in attendance. It might be 50. We have no idea. But if you're planning to attend, just try to give us a heads up. You can go to the website and just send us a, a message on the website saying, you know, looking forward to seeing you or something like that. Uh, good morning, uh, Rick, watching again this week. Nice to see you. Uh, this show is also simulcast uh, from the radio show also on Facebook Live. So if you're listening on the radio show and you hear me say good morning to somebody, it's because they're popping up on my Facebook feed and I can see that they're watching the show. So my topics for today are, and I'm expecting a phone call from Don, my longtime listener Don sent me an email with some follow-up questions to last week's program, so I'm expecting his phone call. But I'm going to be talking about uh, a car accident in Florida whose insurance actually is supposed to pay first? And that's a question from my beautiful wife. Our daughter is now driving, and her cousin is in town, and her cousin wanted to drive her car yesterday, and of course it was uh, floated over to me, is it okay if she drives the car? And my response was, I prefer not, because there's what we know as vicarious liability if an accident were to happen. Um, I hate to be the stick in the mud, but by its very nature, an accident is never intended. It's always an accident. And if one happens while somebody is driving your car or a car you, that you own, then you can have problems because of that. So it's best to just avoid those problems if you can. So I'm going to be talking about whose insurance is primary in a situation like that, where you've got somebody driving another person's car. I'll be talking about non-compete agreements and are they truly valid and enforceable in the state of Florida? The answer is yes. So I'll be talking about those in more detail. And then of course, if I have the time, 
by Trustee Florida Law Weekly. There's a couple of interesting cases in here. A case involving a divorce and personal injury settlement proceeds. Are they considered marital assets or not? And also, what is a vexatious litigant? If you've ever heard the term and you're wondering what exactly does that mean, well, I have the case to explain it for you. Now, throughout my case, uh, not my case, throughout my show, if you have any questions at all, I would love for you to interrupt me and my topics and say, Jeff, this is what's going on in my world, and this is the question I have, and I would really like for you to give me some free legal advice because that is precisely why I'm here. Every Saturday morning at 7.30, I really enjoy talking to people, discussing their legal issues, and attempting to help them when I can. So if you want to call into the show, it's 877-850-8585. That's the number to call into the show, be live with me. If you do get live on the air with me, then just uh, don't tell us the names of any persons or companies that you're wanting to sue or that have done you wrong or anything else because I don't want this to turn into a big fight during the show. So let's talk about the first topic. Uh, you're driving somebody else's car and an accident occurs and it looks as though the accident is your fault. Uh, not an unusual set of circumstances, to be honest. We see it quite a bit. So the question is, all right, well, whose insurance company is supposed to pay? Now, last week, I talked about how in Florida, your own insurance, specifically PIP coverage, personal injury protection coverage, will begin to pay for your medical treatment and perhaps medical treatment of other people in your car, depending on whether or not they are in your household, whether they have insurance of their own. There's a lot of different, you know, it's like bar exam questions about whether PIP pays or not. But the topic for today's discussion is what if somebody else is driving a car that doesn't belong to them? Well, there are oftentimes in an accident what we call layers of coverage. You know, what insurance policy is going to be considered primary and then what insurances are going to be considered secondary. When you get into uh, the excess market, uh, like umbrella coverages, and if you get into uh, extensive amounts of insurance coverage, uh, you know, well into the millions of dollars, the insurance policies are specifically written to say that this policy is not actually going to pay for anything until the underlying coverage is maxed out and pays everything. Um, that's not really the focus of my discussion today. The focus of my discussion today is that what if I'm driving somebody else's car? Well, the rule in Florida, generally speaking, is that your insurance follows you wherever you go. And so your specifically, your automobile insurance should provide coverage for you for an accident that you may cause, even if you're driving somebody else's car, as long as you are a permissive user of that car. So the example that I gave my wife last night as we were talking about this is, you know, for example, you may have car insurance, but let's say you make the really bad choice of going out and stealing somebody else's car because you want to go on a joyride. Well, understandably, your insurance is not going to provide coverage for an accident that you cause uh, after having stolen somebody's car because you're not a permissive user and because it's against the law. But uh, in addition to your automobile insurance, also, this is tangential, but understand that your homeowner's insurance also follows you because most people I, I find are not aware of this, homeowner's insurance actually protects you for general negligence. Now, in every homeowner's policy, there's gonna be written an exclusion that says we do not cover negligence uh, due to the operation of a vehicle or any kind of heavy equipment or a boat or anything like that. Uh, you can't expect your homeowner's policy to kick in for a car accident. That's understood, that's expected, but if you're negligent in some other way that doesn't have anything to do with the operation of a vehicle, a boat, so on and so forth, your homeowner's policy also does follow you and can provide coverage for your negligent actions. Now, keep in mind, I'm using the term negligent because similar to exclusions for operation of a vehicle or a boat or whatever the case may be, there are always exclusions in any insurance policy that says we do not provide coverage for intentional acts. So um, there's never going to be any insurance for something that you did on purpose and that you clearly did on purpose. Now, interesting story, and this is a true story. Uh, the law in Florida says that the insurance can only exclude coverage for the intentional intended act. And I talk about this a lot, um, but I handled a case a very long time ago 
and I'll try to give you the short version since I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, where two elderly men got into a fist fight in a parking lot over an HOA issue in Palm Beach Gardens. Honest, happened. And the older guy, who was 92, got the better of the younger guy, who was like 87. Popped him in the nose, broke his nose. The guy fell to the ground and broke his wrist. Ultimately, the claim was brought against the older gentleman for negligence for the broken wrist. And we prevailed. And why did we prevail? Because obviously they're fighting, it's intentional and everything else. The intended act was the punch to the face and the broken nose. We never recovered for that and there would never be any insurance for that. Now, theoretically, we you know, could have made a claim against the older man individually and you know, taken his own money, but that was not the course that we took. Uh, the course that we took was the claim of negligence for the broken wrist because that was not the intended act. And whether you like it or not, the law in Florida allows for that claim because that is a negligence claim and not an intentional act. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes with insurance companies that most people just are not aware of. By the way, if you have a question, if you have any commentary, if you have uh, something is triggered and you say, oh, I want to ask this question, then you can call into the show, 877-850-8585. That's the number to call into the show to be live with me. Um, so anyway, if you're driving someone's car, if you're a permissive user, but you have insurance of your own and you cause an accident, your own insurance is going to be primary for your acts of negligence. Now, if you're driving somebody else's car and you don't have insurance of your own, mm -hmm. good morning, Janine, hope you're doing well, hope the family's all very well, uh, then assuming that you are a permissive user, then the owner of the vehicle, that policy is going to cover the driver for any acts of negligence. And so um, there, there, there might be a disagreement between um, insurance companies if you're covered and if the other insurance company is covered as to who's supposed to pay for the injuries of the innocent victim or whatever the case may be. But ultimately, those, those get worked out through the different insurance companies, oftentimes cooperatively, sometimes not so cooperatively. But um, just keep in mind, as the owner of a vehicle, or really not just a vehicle, any dangerous instrumentality, and dangerous instrumentality is defined in Florida as being any kind of heavy equipment or something that can injure another person. So jet skis are going to be a dangerous instrumentality. Obviously, any kind of heavy equipment in a construction zone is going to be dangerous instrumentality. Vehicles obviously are. Uh, boats. Uh, if you own anything like that, and I hate to be the stick in the mud, but be careful about who you let drive your stuff because if you let somebody else drive a dangerous instrumentality and they cause an injury to somebody else you theoretically are liable you don't even have to be in the car but because you own it and it, because it's a dangerous instrumentality you are also liable in addition to the driver of it so uh, unfortunately my kids are, are stuck with me telling them that they can't have other people driving their stuff so uh, you should also be somewhat cautious. Now, there is a Florida statute out there, by the way, that limits vicarious liability in a in a tort context to $100,000 of outstanding liability. So here's a good tip for you, and this is why I'm putting on the free legal seminar so that we can talk more and more and more about insurance than you know these 30 minutes that I have every Saturday morning. Talk to your insurance agent, or if you don't use an agent, I recommend you use an agent, but talk to your insurance company and say, I'd like to have at least $100,000 of protection, but you're going to have to have uh, what's called bodily injury coverage protection, so that just in case somebody else is driving your stuff and you become liable under that vicarious liability theory, you will have the coverage to protect you, at least up to the statutory cap. Uh, let me see. Let's talk about non-compete agreements. Uh, oftentimes the topics of my show are generated because of people that call and ask me questions about what may be happening. Very, very close friends of ours uh, who used to live locally, but they moved away. Um, he called me up and said, hey, Jeff, something's happening here at my firm. And, and I've just got a question about this non-compete. You know, can they really use it against us? And, you know, the what's written in there is a sanction. Do, are we possibly ever going to have to pay that? And so... In short, the answer is uh, yes, non-compete agreements in Florida are absolutely enforceable, but it depends on the terms of the non-compete. 
there is a mountain of case law out there in Florida that says that the terms of the non-compete must be reasonable. And unfortunately, you can't go to a textbook and say, okay, what is reasonable? Tell me, what is the geographic reach and what is the duration that is reasonable? Because it all depends on the job of the person against whom the non-compete is sought to enforce. So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about in Florida and I would imagine in other states, but again, I'm only talking about the law in Florida. If you uh, get hired and you're asked to sign a non-compete and you sign it, it basically means that if you quit the job or if you are fired, and yes, it can apply if you are fired, you agree not to compete in the way of joining up with another company that is within a certain geographic reach or within a certain amount of time of when you were either when you quit or when you were fired and so generally speaking very 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 generally speaking because it can be more and it can be less the time frame that the Florida courts have found to be reasonable is two years uh, it can be more and it can be less depending on the circumstances and depending on the job uh, geographically that's different uh, because if it's a sales job if it's a regional sales job you know, a, a 10 mile radius limitation is certainly going to be um, somewhat reasonable, whereas a, you know, a, a 1,000 mile radius is probably not gonna be. So the court will look to the circumstances of every single case, the facts of every single case, and look to the specifics of that job to say, all right, are the terms of the non-compete reasonable and enforceable? Because that, that's the very first thing they have to determine. Because if the terms are not reasonable, then the non-compete is not enforceable, and then it becomes a moot point. But assuming that the geographic reach is reasonable, the duration is reasonable, then the court is then left to decide, okay, what is the remedy here? Now, oftentimes a non-compete will have a uh, liquidated damages provision in it to say, okay, here's the sanction, the monetary sanction. Um, courts are loath really to enforce monetary sanction remedies, but it, it can happen depending again on the circumstances. What's more likely to happen is that the aggrieved party will seek what's called an injunction. An injunction can do one of two things. Most oftentimes, it's somebody filing for an injunction to get somebody else to stop doing something. Um, you see this like in stalking cases all the time, you know, where they get these injunctions where they say, um, my ex-boyfriend is being really creepy and he's saying and doing things that are scaring me and so I want to get an injunction to prevent him from coming within a certain number of feet or yards of me or my house or where I work. So that's, that's a very common form of injunction. It's an order from the court that says to the defendant, you are not allowed to do this anymore for this amount of time. Now, you can also seek an injunction uh, for a proactive position where somebody is not doing something that they're supposed to do and so you file something with the court asking for an injunction to get an order from the court requiring the defendant to do something that they're not doing and most people are not aware of the fact that you can use an injunction to force somebody to do something that they're supposed to do most frequently it's you know to pay for something that they're not paying for uh, but you can uh, seek either one of those remedies it's considered a, an equitable remedy but in most non-competes, it references the fact that the aggrieved party can seek an injunction to prevent that ex-employee from working in his or her new position because they're violating the terms of the non-compete and they are absolutely enforceable. So, as I mentioned, depending on the terms, but uh, so the non-compete has to be facially valid. I've talked about that. Um, if you are then seeking an injunction to enforce the terms of your non-compete, what you would look at is Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 1.610, subsection C, and what it states is that you have to prove four things. Okay, you have to prove, first, the likelihood of irreparable harm. The court is gonna be most concerned about irreparable harm, and of course, that considered it's considered financial as well. So, uh, if, if the aggrieved party can demonstrate that trade secrets are being utilized or profits that it would otherwise uh, receive are going to be diverted or something like that, that's irreparable harm. Number two, 
the unavailability of an adequate legal remedy. As I mentioned a moment ago, an injunction is what's called an equitable remedy. We learn the different types of remedies in our law school class called remedies. Uh, a legal remedy is where you're going to ask for money. Okay, that's essentially a legal remedy. Uh, the injunction is considered an equitable remedy because you're seeking something, uh, and this is kind of a basic explanation, but you're seeking something other than just the money. So you have to be able to prove to the court that there's an um, there's a unavailability of an adequate legal remedy. Now, um, you, the, you can expect the defendant to say, well, judge, you know, they can ultimately get a judgment and collect all of this money at some point later on. But the fact is that the injunction is meant to be immediate. If you file a lawsuit today, especially because of COVID now, but if you file a lawsuit today to enforce the terms of an injunction and you're seeking the legal remedy of money damages, you're not going to get to trial for probably at least three years. I mean, that's what we're telling our clients these days. If you filed today, you're probably not going to get to trial for three years. And so to suggest to the court that getting a judgment in you know, the earliest being three years from now that's not really an adequate legal remedy because you know that could force a company to go out of business or ultimately they may not ever see that money. And so the courts will consider this equitable remedy of an injunction because it's immediate. Once the judge enters the order, then it goes into effect. And if you violate a court order on an injunction, well, then you're talking about some serious business because then ultimately, depending on how many hurdles the, the attorneys jump through, you might go to jail for violating a court order. Number three, you have to be able to prove a substantial likelihood of succeeding on the merits. So, of course, it stands to reason that if you're going to be seeking an injunction, you have to have a good case, and the court's going to want to see that. And then lastly, number four, consideration of the public interest that may support the entry of the injunction. And this is just kind of a public policy thing the courts want to look at, you know, just to make sure that it is going to be consistent with our, our you know, our public interest. Um, it's, I don't know if they consider that a catch-all or what. Kind of vague. Now, if the parties are in addition seeking a bond, which, and I'm, I'm reading from a case by the way, this is the case of Phelan versus Trifactor Solutions. It's out of the second DCA. It was from my Florida Law Weekly case today. If anybody wants more information on the case of Phelan, which is spelled P H E L A N versus Trifactor Solutions, just let me know. I can send you a copy of the case. But in this particular case, there was a violation of the non compete. The uh, company that used to employ the ex-employee, sought the injunction, and was awarded the injunction, and was also awarded, awarded a very arbitration bond, bar, arbitrary bond of $300,000 that the ex-employee had to put up. Well, the appellate decision overruled the injunction and said, for a number of different reasons, the trial court didn't do it right. But essentially, when it comes to a bond, uh, there has to be an evidentiary hearing on the amount of the bond, both parties have to be given an opportunity to present evidence, which is where we get the term evidentiary hearing, so that the judge can make a educated decision on what the amount of the bond should be. Because if you pull an arbitrary number out of the air, in this case that's essentially what the trial judge did according to the appellate decision, then it's going to be reversed and the ex-employee is not going to be required to pay that bond. So. Essentially, those are the issues of a non-compete today. Uh, yes, you're welcome, Janine. That's why I'm here every Saturday morning to try to give out good information. That's what I try to do. But uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions on non-compete, are they enforceable? If you want to show me your non-compete, come to the free legal seminar. That's a fantastic idea. Come to my free legal seminar on April 27th. It's at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Palm Beach Gardens. We are encouraging everybody to absolutely bring your insurance policies, not just your automobile insurance policy, but any insurance policy you may have. A homeowner's policy, if you own a business and you have a business liability policy or a commercial general liability policy, bring it because we'll look at it. We'll talk to you about what exactly is it that you do and is this the right policy for you? And if you have signed a non-compete and you want us to take a look at it, um, I'll be happy to do that. So uh, all the more reason for you guys to show up at the first Bastola Free Legal Seminar, April 27th from 1 to 4 at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Palm Beach Gardens. It is free. Free, 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 free. All you have to do is show up. Uh, you have to wear a face mask. So sorry about that, but those are the rules. Um, 
Good morning, my sister Lee in Tennessee. We have a cold front in April down here. What's up with that? Never had a cold front in April in Florida from what I remember. Hope your weather up in Tennessee is better than what we've got. Uh, let me see. Another thing I wanted to talk about today, and I've got, uh, ooh, I've got like one minute to do that. This is probably perfect. Have you ever wondered what is a vexatious litigant? I, I know you have. A vexatious litigant is one defined minute. in Florida, thank you, Sharina, as a person who, in the immediately preceding five-year period, has commenced, prosecuted, or maintained, pro se, five or more civil actions in any court in the state except an action governed by the Florida Small Claims Rules, which actions have been finally and adversely determined against such person or entity. If you are a vexatious litigant, you are not allowed to file lawsuits on your own behalf unless you have court approval if you've been deemed to be a vexatious litigant. So now you know. I'm Jeff Bastola. I am an attorney giving free legal advice. If you'd like to call me anytime, anywhere, weekend, night, doesn't matter, 833-VASTOLA. That's 833-827-8652. Everybody have a great weekend and God bless. Thank you, Sharina.